This is Kat Rosenfield. I am a freelance culture writer and Persuasion's advice columnist. And today I'm inviting you to read my latest long form essay, Love Hurts, subtitle, So Let's Stop Infantilizing Women and Demonizing Men. For a long time, our society has been preoccupied with the notion that sex is degrading to women, dating back to a time when a marriageable daughter was a valuable commodity whereby upper class families could increase their power and prestige. But a hundred years after feminism's first wave, this anxiety over women and sex is still with us, wrapped up in contemporary progressive concerns about trauma, consent, and the Me Too movement. The damage in question is emotional, not material, but the fear is the same, that women will be ruined by sex. It's a big thing on the left, particularly in the wake of Me Too, to argue that the relationships between men and women are all about power, and hence that women are perpetually disadvantaged, always on the precipice of victimhood. The result is a dating landscape where every relationship is seen as a potential pathway to abuse, nobody trusts each other, and sex itself has become problematized. It seems dangerous and not fun at all. In my essay, I explore how a noble impulse to protect young women from discomfort or unhappiness has led to this toxic miasma, and how we might find our way out of it by reacquainting ourselves with the radical notion that women are people who can handle a little discomfort or even a broken heart. Kat Rosenfield's piece called Love Hurts was published by Persuasion. To learn more about the community we're building at Persuasion and to get similar articles directly into your inbox, head to www.persuasion.community. Sure, we can speculate that terrible things can happen. Let's speculate about the terrible things that will happen if we don't bring down our emissions. You know, I'm not advocating nuclear for fun. I'm advocating for nuclear because we need to bring down our emissions. I think we're all in agreement about that. And even right now, we have no plan to bring them down. And now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Today, I'm very happy to welcome on the podcast Zion Lights. Zion is very interesting. She is a writer and activist about climate change and other environmental challenges. She was one of the leading members of Extinction Rebellion and actually came to some mixed prominence because of a broadcast interview in Britain where some of the claims of this very radical environmentalist movement were put in question and she didn't really have very good answers for them. She couldn't quite justify her views and that helped to set in train process of reflection, a process of change, in which Zion came to two conclusions. First, that she should leave Extinction Rebellion because she didn't agree with a group on some of their policies and some of their tactics. Uh, and second, that if she is serious about fighting climate change, she should actually embrace nuclear power, which was a very surprising conclusion for her. So we had a conversation about her history with Extinction Rebellion and her decision to leave it, but also more broadly about what it means to change your mind as an activist and how that form of persuasion can actually take place. Zion Lights, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So Zion, you have a very interesting story in that you joined Extinction Rebellion, this sort of radical environmentalist activist group in the United Kingdom very early on. You became one of the spokespeople But then you had a kind of change of heart about one of the core policy positions of Extinction Rebellion, which is that they oppose nuclear power. Tell us a little bit about what attracted you to joining the group and how you came to have misgivings about it, how you came to change your mind on this crucial issue. Well, they don't actually have any kind of policy on nuclear power. So it wouldn't be accurate to say that that's why I left. I would say that there are a lot of people who are ideologically opposed within not just Six Rebellion, but just the wider environmental movement. And that's kind of always been the case. But there are also people who do support nuclear power in Six Rebellion and in the wider movement. I got involved with Six Rebellion shortly after they were founded and became their spokesperson, was active in the media team, and later on also founded the Hourglass newspaper, which was an example of a print newspaper that kind of displayed a model of climate reporting. So it's very active in my role with Extinction Rebellion. I felt that Extinction Rebellion did an incredible job in shifting the narrative and making climate change something 
that was easy to talk about, that we gave journalists opportunities to talk about it by reporting on our actions. We helped, along with Fridays for the Future, raise awareness of what's happening to the planet. We came up with the term climate and ecological emergency. All of those things, I think, were really well done. But for me, there came a point where I thought, well, we've done that now. And, and even now, even during this pandemic here in Britain, at least, polling shows that environment and climate change are still really high on people's list of concerns. So I kind of felt like it was time to move on to the next step, which for me was advocating for solutions. So let's start by talking about this particular issue. And then I'm interested also in hearing about more broadly how you feel about the tactics of Extinction Rebellion and what brings about effect of social change. So what are the misgivings that many environmentalists have about nuclear power? And why do you think that despite those misgivings, people who are serious about combating climate change actually need to embrace it? I used to be one of these people who was afraid of nuclear power. My understanding was based completely on misconceptions. And if you're in the environment movement, it's just kind of standard that you're surrounded by people who share those misconceptions, which reinforces them. So I believed that it wasn't safe. I be- believed that it wasn't clean. I believed that there was a real issue with waste management and radiation. And once I started looking into the facts and I looked at actual data, I found that, well, the number of deaths that I'd been told that had occurred from nuclear is actually much, much lower than what I had been led to believe, that waste is extremely well managed, in fact, better managed than any of the alternatives in the energy production sector. And that it is extremely clean and reliable energy that also involves a very compact site to generate potentially kind of 80 years of energy from a single site. So all of these make it extremely clean or green or whatever terminology you want to give it. However, it has an incredibly bad image problem, I think. I think that all of these fears have seeped in for many different reasons. And I think one of the things is that when the disasters have happened, there has been such panic around them that that has really kind of affected people's feelings and helped to stoke their fears about nuclear. Even though if you look at the disasters and you look at the numbers of the people affected, it's still so much lower than compared to, for example, fossil fuels, which actually, again, here in Britain, we're mostly reliant on fossil fuels. We get our energy mostly about 40% from gas. And at the moment, we're also using coal. So anyone can check this. You can go to electricitymap.org, put in the country you live in, and it will tell you what the energy sources were for that day. So the last time I checked a couple of days ago, there was coal on there. It's about 40% gas. And if you look at the data, it's really clear that actually there is quite a high death toll from fossil fuels in the extraction process and the mining and all of the things that are involved. And that's including all of the nuclear disasters added up, it still makes it safer. It's a safer alternative. And actually learning that for me was a huge unraveling of what I believed and very challenging. And I had to very slowly come to terms with it. And when I started talking to people about it, I found that a lot of people didn't want to hear it. Some did, but a lot of people, you know, it kind of, um, I don't know, I think sometimes ideology becomes so embedded in who you are that it becomes part of your identity. And so if you are challenged on these things, it feels like you're being attacked personally, and then it's completely impossible to have a conversation about it. So let me push two sort of objections to nuclear power, which I think of a sort of standard response. And I have more sympathy for one of those than the other, as you'll see. So the first one is, well, you know, look, if we're completely changing the nature of our energy sources, if we have to move radically away from the sources we currently have, why not go whole hog? Why end up with this other technology which does have security risks, which has to be produced with industrial scale, which needs very heavy state involvement of a somewhat problematic kind in certain places? Why not go all the way and just go 100% renewable? What's wrong with that argument? The problem is that we cannot go 100% renewable, and that is not even just my opinion, that is basic arithmetic, as the late Dr. David Mackay would say, if anyone's interested in reading up on this, you know, he crunched the numbers and put them in his book without the hot air. It's free to read online. He made it accessible for everybody so that they could have a look at the data themselves. The problem is that we have case studies like Germany. So Germany decided as part of its energy wind project to invest heavily in renewables and they prioritize closing nuclear power plants above coal. And what happened is they started to shut down their nuclear plants and their emissions went up because they had to import coal, even though they invested so much money. I mean, they invested billions in renewables 
And even if it can provide more energy, which it can, there's a problem of intermittency. What happens when it's not sunny? What happens when the wind isn't blowing? So this even happened here again in Britain. Recently, we had a heat wave, the turbine stopped turning. We went from about 20% wind to 4% and we had to import the rest and it was coal. It comes from other countries and we all know that we need to stop using coal. So there's a problem of intermittency. Some environmentalists I've spoken to have said, well, that's not a problem. We all just need to learn to live with less. And I think that's extremely naive, actually, because we need reliable power to keep our hospitals running. We need reliable power on extremely cold days so that people can warm their homes. We cannot have intermittent power. And another example is California, where they've recently had all of these blackouts. And partly it is that they have an unstable energy situation. They've again invested quite heavily in renewables and shut nuclear down. Obviously, it's also been impacted by wildfires. So there's multiple things going on there, but they actually experienced blackouts, which is a really serious issue because their hospitals did stop running. What about the people who are on machinery that needs to continue running? What about the vaccines that have to stay at a certain temperature in the fridges? This is a really important part of the problem that isn't talked about enough. And we still get this kind of idealistic view that 100% renewables is fine. It can fix everything. And it simply can't. The numbers do not add up. And you'll find this in the IPCC report, if you read the 1.5 warming report, which environmentalists love to give us an example for showing us what's happening to the climate. That same report has an energy section by Working Group 3, and it tells us what we need for our energy requirements. And it includes nuclear, renewables and carbon capture storage. You can't just cut the nuclear bit out as if the numbers are still going to add up the same. They're not. This is data that has a huge scientific consensus. So, you know, I'm quite convinced by this argument. I've looked at some of the data myself, and I think that unfortunately, it does seem unrealistic to get in the timescale we need towards 100% renewables. Um, So, uh, you know, effectively, at least for many decades, we will face a hard choice between nuclear power and fossil fuel. I'm also convinced by some of the safety argument you made, that when you look at the historical figures, it is quite clear that nuclear has, up until this point, been safer than fossil fuels, certainly safer than coal, but also safer than many other forms of fossil fuel extraction. And for a long time, I was actually on your side of the argument, which is to say that I was quite convinced that if you're serious about climate change, and if you look at the facts, and if you look at the science, you just need to make nuclear a part of the mix. I've actually slightly moved away from that position, or at least become less certain of that position over the last year or so. And so I'd like to put my qualms to you. And this is that we haven't yet seen the worst case scenario with nuclear power. You know, when you look at Chernobyl, we were quite close to things being much worse than they turned out. And you can see that in a few other places. And when I look at the extent to which human systems can fail, when I look, for example, at the ways in which many countries have completely failed to deal with a coronavirus epidemic in a sensible way, when I look at the wrong incentives that exist, especially in authoritarian countries where people and plant managers might have a greater short-term interest in lying to their superiors than in actually fixing a safety issue, I do worry about how we can avert that worst case scenario with nuclear power. Is it worth the small risk of a truly catastrophic outcome? And if we actually scale up nuclear power, including in many countries that aren't particularly well governed, that aren't democratic, but don't have a free press, are we running too big a risk of a worst case scenario in the future that might look very different from the supposed worst case scenarios that we've experienced so far? I think it's completely natural to worry about these things, and it's good that we worry about them. So the worst disaster we've had is Chernobyl. And we now know through years of focusing on the problem and what went wrong, we know exactly what went wrong. We know that it was an issue of safety procedures not being followed. And because of that, there are now so many extra procedural things that are put in place so that it can never happen again. And this means that actually making these reactors now takes twice as long as it used to because there are so many additional safety measures. I mean, anyone who has questions about it, I urge you to either read up on it or ask someone who works as a nuclear engineer in safety because I've had countless conversations. It's one of the things that's really convinced me that I didn't realize and that isn't really talked about enough. The other thing I would say is Fukushima is an extreme example of something that happened because it was caused by 
a tsunami. You know, the tsunami took over 15,000 lives. That's how terrible that tsunami was. But actually, no one at Fukushima died from radiation, which is what all the fear and panic around it was. But 535 people who did die died in the evacuation process because they panicked. So I would actually argue that the fear of some kind of massive meltdown hurting lots of people is worse than the actual disaster itself. And sure, we can speculate that terrible things can happen. Let's speculate about the terrible things that will happen if we don't bring down our emissions. You know, I'm not advocating nuclear for fun. I'm advocating for nuclear because we need to bring down our emissions. I think we're all in agreement about that. I've been campaigning for that for over 15 years. And all I've seen, no matter what approach I've taken, is the emissions go up. And even right now, we have no plan to bring them down. And we know that we are on an awful trajectory. We know that things are going to get so much worse, especially for people in the global south. I don't think I need to go into all the evidence there. We're all well aware that this is an issue. The way of tackling climate change is to bring down emissions. It's as simple as that. Now, we agree that renewables, they can be part of the mix, but they're not going to do it on their own. So it's either fossil fuels or nuclear. And as I say, you can go to um, ourworldanddata.org is quite good. It gives you a good overview of the numbers. And fossil fuels actually have a much higher death toll, a much higher negative impact on humans than nuclear. And that's just from the extraction process and all of that. But actually, if you add the number of deaths from air pollution, you know, someone said to me recently, it was an environmentalist about coal. I said, I can't believe we're still importing coal in this century. You know, it's ridiculous. And he said, well, it's only occasional, you know, it's not a huge impact. What about the impact of the communities who have to live near these coal plants? I urge people to read up on that. They're often poor because, I mean, they're always poor because they cannot afford to move out of those areas. They cannot open their front windows because they're covered in soot. They have high levels of illnesses, especially to do with the lungs. They have children with severe respiratory issues. So anytime the wind's not blowing and we import coal, we're just outsourcing the problem elsewhere. Because it's not happening here, we don't have to care about it. And I think that's completely morally wrong, actually. If we have an option of something we can build here that we take care of and that is not impacting people negatively abroad, and especially often in kind of underdeveloped countries where these plants are based, then we have to do it. We have to press on with it. We need to make sure the safety measures are in place, which they are, precisely because of Chernobyl and Fukushima. Although, as I say, people have a real misconception about what happened to Fukushima. And I really urge them to read up because it was actually Fukushima that completely changed my mind. So I used to advocate for just completely getting rid of nuclear. I thought it was really bad. I believed that all these deaths had been caused. And then I looked at the data and I just couldn't believe that I completely believed things that weren't true. And that's actually really easy for anyone to research and look into. Let me ask you about a few other aspects of Extinction Rebellion. So we made some controversial claims about the nature of the climate emergency. As you're saying, they are part of an environmentalist movement that doesn't perhaps take the question of what we actually need to do in order to deal with climate change quite seriously enough when it comes to questions like nuclear power. But they were also criticized for some of the tactics of ways in which they really disrupt the daily life and inconvenience people. How is your feeling on some of those tactics or some of those strategies evolved? What do you think social movements that advocate for important causes should and shouldn't do in order to draw attention to those topics and get people on board? Well, as I said earlier, I really think that their focus on grabbing media attention by causing disruption helped to change the dialogue around climate change. So I was talking about climate change for years, years beforehand, and it was very hard to keep that discussion going. And there was a lot of denial and a lot of people just didn't appreciate the seriousness of it. And around the same time, Fridays for the Future was formed, Extinction Rebellion was formed, and the IPCC 1.5 warming report came out. All that happened at the same time, and it was just like, bam, conversation has changed. And yes, we forced attention to the issue by causing mass disruption. I was there on Waterloo Bridge, you know, when we closed it in April, and we were there for two weeks. And every day there was press coming to speak to us and we could use every opportunity to talk about the climate emergency. And I think with that tactic, they actually did a really good job and that it was necessary because, as I say, I had been trying lots of different ways for many years. I mean, 10 years ago, I was involved in climate action doing similar work and it just really hadn't moved on the dialogue. I'd been involved in so many groups and it hadn't happened. I'd written books, I'd done all kinds of things. So this was really good, something that they did that was really good. And then I got more involved and I was kind of 
involved in the strategy where I was told, look, we're trying to get 3.5% of the population on board. And if you look at my early work with Extinction Rebellion as a spokesperson, that's what I was talking about a lot. It was all about getting people on board. So what I think has happened, and this happens with a lot of movements, I think it happened with Occupy as well, actually. I think there are parallels there, is that they've kind of lost their way in their vision. And I know they won't like me saying this because they take criticism extremely badly. <laughs> if you've seen the press release they put out about me recently, it just shows that. But, you know, they need to hear this because... They did a really good thing. They were getting people on board and then they've kind of crashed and burned and lost that strategy. You know, it's not about getting people on board anymore. They've got this other strategy. So they did Canning Town that upset people, lost them a lot of support. And then they did the media blockade recently that also upset a lot of people. Now, I understand that they, they're actually... Can you a little bit about what each of those things were for people, especially outside of Britain, who may not... Okay. So Canning Town was an action, basically a small group of people glued themselves and climbed on top of the DLR. It's kind of like the tube in London. And to summarize, it became very heated. They expected there to be security on site and they weren't. And so the public who were waiting to get on the tube to get to work kind of got aggressive. It turned into a bit of a mobbish situation. One of the people got pulled off the train and was repeatedly kicked. It's all caught on video so anyone can watch it. And it went absolutely viral here. And it was all anyone was talking about. And it really lost a lot of support, especially because the area they targeted was quite a poor area. You know, those people were very saying on camera, look, we care about the climate, but this is not the way to do it. I need to get to work. I'm going to lose my job. And so they came under heavy criticism for that. And actually, they kind of have responded because in a way they've gone, all right, maybe that wasn't the best action. Next time we're going to take the focus off public transport disruption, which is actually what their model had been before that. And we're going to take it somewhere else. And they took it to the media. So very recently they did a media blockade where they stopped newspapers from being delivered. You know, I've never seen it before. I went into a local supermarket and there was a handwritten sign on the door on the way in saying these newspapers are not in stock today because of the Extinction Rebellion protest. And they were just empty shelves. There was just no papers and the ones that they had blocked so that, you know, they achieved that aim, which was instead of going for the public, we're going to go for these specific papers because we don't believe in there being a monopoly of the press. And then Priti Patel and our government kind of responded saying, look, you're attacking free speech. It's not okay." But what I saw from my end, especially now that I've stepped out of Extinction Rebellion, is that actually everybody was fuming about the free press issue. So they had a successful action that they did on the ground, but they didn't have a media strategy to talk about why they'd done it. And I just didn't see that anywhere. I just didn't see that the reason they were doing this was to talk about media monopoly. And they were concerned that involves, you know, people who are climate deniers. So I think even that strategy, although they'll term it as a success because they blockade, I don't think it's actually reaching people. Therefore, I don't think it's working. And I think if they're not going to try and get people on board, then sure, they can do these things where they instead are agitating the state and raising awareness, but they need to get the awareness part right. And that hasn't worked at all. If I'm not hearing about the reason they've done it from anybody around me, then I don't think they're reaching people at all. They're just in an echo chamber. And that's often the case with a lot of these groups. They just operate in an echo chamber And it's really important to reach outside of that, which is why I founded a print newspaper that was distributed around the UK, just to get other people involved in the conversation, which I think is vital for any of these movements to survive. So we've talked about some of the specific policies and we've talked about some of the strategies that these movements use. I think I have another question that I've thought about a lot in the context of climate change, which is how you stop this from being a culture war. I mean, if you want to get a sustained action on climate change, within a country like the United Kingdom or the United States, and not just within one or two countries, but across most of the developed nations in the world, it cannot be a deeply culturally divisive issue because otherwise, clearly, successive governments are going to have very, very different approaches to it. And whatever progress is made under one government will be unmade by different. But one of the senses I get on issues like climate change is that it is often people who are affluent and educated and live in urban centers talking to other people in a way that immediately raises the hackles. I saw that with some of the Extinction Rebellion things where some of the people I saw in the media were basically saying, well, look, we should just stop economic growth. You know, we already have too much. We should content ourselves with living more simply and with fewer things. And that's a way to deal with climate change. And actually Greta Thunberg in her speech at the UN did also talk about an end to economic growth at one point. Now, I think that that's deeply alienating to a lot of people 
who are having trouble making ends meet at the end of a month, who actually don't live in particularly nice circumstances, who think, well, hang on a second, I do actually want an extra room so I can have space for my kid that's on the way or whatever the other things might be, who say, well, look, you know, I live out in the countryside. I don't have good public transport here. I'm not just realistic, but there's going to be. So I will need a car. And I feel like these people just will tell me to take a bicycle. So how do you deal with this challenge? How do you gather people around the issue of climate change, but in a more optimistic and forward-looking way that doesn't essentially tell people that they have to change their lifestyle or that they have to content themselves with lesser material circumstances than they might otherwise enjoy? The degrowth argument has existed in the environmental movement for as long as I've been involved and I think well before. So I think there are several things going on here. First of all, I used to advocate for those lifestyles because I lived one. I had a book published which was about how to live more sustainably, how to lower your carbon footprint using science. And I have had a very low carbon footprint for years. I don't drive, you know, I don't fly. But I appreciate that this is very difficult for people. And I think we have to be realistic, which is to say, A, people will always move in the direction of progress and convenience. That's just like an evolutionary imperative, right? If it's easier, if it gives us a higher quality of life, our children are going to be healthier, children are going to benefit, then we're going to just do it. So unless those things that I'm talking about that lower your carbon footprint are made easier, then it's not going to happen. And some things have been made easier and some haven't. And and maybe that will improve over time, but not in the timescale that we're talking about in terms of bringing down emissions. Now, there's another kind of argument in this, which is that, yes, I advocated for this 15 years ago when I was first involved with the movement. But now, 15 years later, I've come to accept that people don't want to live that way. Just as you're saying, it's anecdotal, but let's look at this fact, which is that all the behavioral science in the world, all the best behavioral scientists have not worked out a way to actually get people to lower their footprint significantly enough for it to make any difference to emissions. And also the kind of amount that they're talking about is exponential. So the last report I saw, it was kind of a zero carbon report, which said that we could all live with less and we could have our energy from renewables and that would be enough. It required a 40% reduction of personal energy usage. Can you imagine using 40% less? I mean, I just can't. And I already have, as I say, quite a low carbon footprint. It's a lot to ask of people. And it's, I mean, the crux of it is that it's unrealistic. It's great to have these idealistic visions, but it's unrealistic and clinging to that after 15 years and long, you know, longer than that, as long as it's existed, is unrealistic. So we have to find other ways, which is why I've come around to saying energy consumption is going up. We need to bring down emissions. We're going to need a clean energy source that is going to still enable people to have a high quality of life. And the other thing is that, yes, it is a very privileged position to take, not just between people in this country who are struggling and who are not struggling. But if you think about in other countries that want to develop. So, for example, my parents migrated here in the 70s from a village in the Punjab in India near the Himalayas. Now, they don't have electricity. They have, you know, very little infrastructure. They want what we have. They want very much what we have. It's why my parents left their home country to come here and to embrace the ability to buy things and to have healthy children and to be able to get vaccinated and all the healthcare and all the benefits that they have had. They want a high quality of life. And now we're saying we don't want them to burn fossil fuels and do what we did because the world literally cannot take it. And I'm not disagreeing with that. But then we're all going to work out how they can develop without doing that. And perhaps it means that they will have an intermittent period where they will continue to develop using dirty fuels. And that means that we almost have a moral obligation, I think, to bring our emissions right down as quickly as possible to enable them to do it so that we're not continuing to pump so much CO2 into the atmosphere. Obviously, it's not as simple as that, but those are the simple facts involved with that degrowth argument. It is not fair to say that they have to continue to live that way. And also, these are some of the regions that are going to be hardest hit by climate change. If they don't have the infrastructure, then they will not be able to cope. So there's a UN report that found that 40% of India won't have access to water by 2030. So that's a huge amount of people that will not have access to water. I mean, sure, they'll migrate, but to where? We're talking about cities as well. Delhi will be impacted. You know, people in the villages, their wells dry up. A lot of them are farmers. A lot of my family over there are farmers. They rely on frequent rains just to be able to eat. What are they going to do as an alternative? I've looked into this because I find it really concerning. And I've seen that desalination could be an option. But guess what you need for desalination? Huge amounts of energy. You need huge amounts of energy to convert ocean water into something that's drinkable. So 
everything I look at seems to come back to this issue of energy. And instead of pretending that people are all going to change their lifestyles overnight and use less, we need to accept the fact that we've got to find a way to transition to clean energy instead. And actually, something worries me is that at some point, I think the government will get to a point where they say, right, the emissions haven't come down, nothing's worked, we're going to have to force people to do it. And I think that is the worst outcome. And I've actually heard people argue for this and say, well, if we need totalitarianism, that's okay. And I just completely disagree with that. I do not think some kind of eco-fascism or authoritarian rule is good in any way. And the reason I'm in this fight now is because I'm trying to prevent that from ever happening. I've been struck during public appearances speaking about democracy and the threat to it from a foreign populists around the world, but especially in Europe, how often that question comes up where people say, well, look, you're talking about threats to democracy, but you know, really, if we're going to deal with climate change, don't we just have to give up on democracy and hand power over to some benevolent dictator? I mean, that not only raises the extent to which dictatorships have actually been much worse environmentally than democracies historically, but it is also, I think, putting people in front of just a completely unacceptable choice. And this comes often from highly educated, liberal-minded people who sort of think of themselves as having the best of intentions. I'm really struck by the resonance of that argument in certain circles, and I agree with you that it's very dangerous. Um, more broadly, I also strongly think that the way to get people on board with the fight against climate change, and frankly, the way to do justice, especially to people in less developed countries around the world, is not to be less ambitious for our future. It's not to tell people that there's going to be a limit on how much energy and electricity we can use. It's not to think of the electrification of uh, villages in, in India and in China and other parts of the world as somehow something bad rather than an amazing development which gives people opportunity and dignity that they have lacked until very recently. So I think this optimistic vision of how we can achieve those things while still dealing with climate change is both morally right and politically shrewd. It is the only way that we can get effective action on climate change, and it's the only way that we won't end up sacrificing the rights and interests of lots and lots of people around the world in the fight against climate change. But I want to go beyond that for a moment to a kind of meta question, because one of the things that I find very interesting about your story and your evolution is the ways in which you have changed your mind over the last months. And, you know, I run a publication called Persuasion, so we're thinking about how it is that you can actually persuade people and change people's minds. Now, one of the things that I find striking in that respect is that we tend to think of persuading as being done in the middle and the heat of an argument, right? Like we're having a disagreement about nuclear power and I come up with a killer argument and it's so obviously a great argument. I show that I'm so smart that you have no choice but to submit to my superior intellect and boom, you're converted, right? I think that's nearly never how persuasion works. And it's very, very rare that people change their minds in the middle of an argument, unless it's about something that we don't care very much about. I think more often, it seems to me, is a gradual evolution where a forceful argument, you know, you might angry reject it, but it plants a seed in your mind. And slowly as you, you know, it opens your eyes to a different kind of set of arguments, a different kind of set of facts. And as you keep coming across them, your mind slowly evolves, probably not in those moments where you're in the middle of a fight and sort of all of your defenses are up. But in the quiet of your own study, when you're reflecting on it over time, is that what this sort of gradual evolution on the topic of nuclear energy or on some of those other questions has been like for you? Or was there a moment when you thought, hang on a second, the scales are falling from my eyes, I'm actually on the other side of the argument now? It was absolutely an evolution. First of all, I came across that paper about Fukushima and it completely just turned what I understood about nuclear upside down. But I didn't suddenly start advocating for it. I was a member of the Green Party at the time and I went to a conference on energy and I found that nuclear barely came up. And when it did, it was really negative. And I was kind of curious. At that point, I was really just curious. I was not advocating at all. And I put my hand up and I asked a question to the panel about nuclear and they wouldn't even answer it. Those kinds of things kept happening. And I started thinking, hang on a minute, what if this is all just ideology? And someone came to me afterwards and said, you're not pro-nuclear, are you? And I said, if we're so sure that we're right, why can't we question it? And I started to realize that I was a little bit different in this way, that actually I wanted to know what the truth was and I was willing to maybe change my mind. And so I spoke to more people. I actually ended up quitting the Green Party. I spoke to more people about it. I read more research. But it's quite an unusual thing to do 
you know, very few people do that. Very few people even have the science literacy ability to do that, you know. So I did that. And then I went back to university and I did a master's in science communication precisely because I wanted to understand well, how do you communicate with people about these issues because they're really important. And what you kind of described as well, where you try to just give facts to people and expect them to just change their mind, that's described in science communication as a deficit model. And it's they basically say, don't do it. People are not just empty cups for you to fill up with a jug of knowledge you know that's actually really off-putting to someone you probably think of course it is but I see people do it all the time when they're trying to persuade someone the best thing to do is actually to appeal to kind of values and feelings and the thing with nuclear is it's all about feelings people feel positive and good about renewables it's even in the name renewable that's a great name nuclear has all this baggage and it's related completely to fears about waste and radiation and safety whereas actually you know there's lots of bad things that you could link to renewables there is for example indigenous people in Norway who've been kicked off the land over land grabs for huge amounts of acres of land that are being given to wind turbines. And then just today I saw in the news that there are protected trees in California, Joshua trees, that are going to be bulldozed in order to create a solar farm. So those issues exist with all energy production methods and they need to be weighed up. And again, this is why I like nuclear because you can have it on your own land, in your own country. It's a compact site. You know, I was literally there two weekends ago at the Sizewell site having a swim on the beach. You can swim and you can see where the Sizewell B is and, you know, that's where Sizewell C is going to as well and I just feel like well I can see that I can see it's not polluting I can see it's safe that makes me happy so I'm trying to advocate it in a more kind of positive way and take people away from some of those fears but it's definitely you know requires multiple conversations and being open-minded as well instead of just expecting people to just change their minds I absolutely didn't do it overnight and it was a while even before I would talk about it because I knew that it would upset people around me people are very tribalistic and this is true for everyone and it's a natural evolutionary thing you know if you are kicked out of your tribe traditionally it meant that you might not survive so it's natural to want to keep those people in your group happy and if you're an environmentalist it's very difficult to be a pro-nuclear advocate in that space so what I'm actually trying to create is some kind of new environmentalism that's pro-human humans are good <laughs> so it sounds really simple but let's be honest this kind of dialogue has creeped in about humans having sinned against nature and we've done bad things you know that's not the case humans are good humans don't deserve to suffer yes we need to restore the natural balance we need to do more to protect us from climate change and to restore land but we need to do it in a sensible way, not just be guided by our gut feelings, because actually that is kind of where we've been at for years, like what Germany's experiment in renewables has done. And the reality is you can literally just look at the numbers and see emissions have gone up from increased coal use. That's not the right way to do it. I'm really interested by this idea that you don't want to leave your tribe. And because you don't want to leave your tribe, there are certain things you don't want to speak about. I actually think it goes even deeper than that, which is that there are certain things you don't want to think about. You realize if you think about some topic too hard and you end up on the other side of it, then you suddenly have a dilemma, which is do you talk about it? In which case you might be cast out of your own tribe or do you start lying? to people? And so the safest thing to do is to just not even really engage the topic to sort of, mm -hmm. even if in your own mind, mouth the platitudes, oh, of course, nuclear energy is terrible or whatever other topic it may be. So I guess one question is, you know, why do you think some people end up asking themselves those difficult questions and why do other people not? Or to put it differently, I certainly aspire to be honest with myself about what I think about the world and not to shy away from asking myself those difficult questions. How should we go about doing that? How should we push ourselves to actually think through those questions with an open mind rather than running away from them? I co-wrote an article on this with the musician Jose Gonzalez recently, calling for people to step out of ideology and be more eco-rational. Now, I actually think that this is happening and that it's happening more now than ever before. If you look at things like the anti-max protests and anti-5G protests, there's kind of a lot happening on the other side. So more and more people are now advocating for and speaking about science, which means that they're having to look at their own views and have some of those views challenged. The tribal thing is interesting because... Yes, it puts you in a risky space if you're willing to do that. But I think based on the number of people that reached out to me after I left XR and after I started talking about these issues, I think there's a lot more of them than we realize. And it's almost like they're asking for a new space to move into and what they really need to be able to step out of where they are at, which is an ideologically driven space, is a tribe 
that is based on rational responses, that is based on, you know, evidence that is led by evidence. And let's be honest, we are not going to tackle the world's problems unless we are in that space. We're not going to do it with ideology. We're probably going to go backwards, which is what I've seen happen for years in environmentalism. I knew when I was at school, when I learned about global warming, that this was happening. And what have we done since then? We've still got Greta Thunberg saying, we need to act now, we need to act now, but we need to act with solutions that are evidence-based in all areas, not just energy, although, you know, energy is a huge chunk of it because of the emissions issue, but also, you know, rewilding, planting trees and spaces, changing the way we use land for agriculture. All of those things need to happen, but they need to be evidence driven. And I think a lot of people are coming around to this, especially because it's become this kind of anti-science movement that has made more people say, well, actually, hang on, I don't agree with that. I'm going to stand up for science. That means I need to look into what the science means. And oh, hang on, that means that I have to change my view in this area. And I think once you've done it once, it's much easier to do. And I think it's a great space to be in because in a way, I'm more open-minded now. And I, I would have said that I was before, but actually now, because I'm open to changing those ideas, it's not that one argument would change my mind, but if there's a huge body of scientific evidence that tells me I'm wrong, I'm proud to say that then I would change my mind on that issue. And I think that the amount of kind of support I've had after doing that shows that people do value it and people do aspire to that. It's just the tribal thing that holds people back. And in environmentalism, it's always been very tribalistic and it has often been this kind of anti-GMO, anti-nuclear, you know, kind of anti-evidence-based movement. And so really there's a space right now to create a pro science environmental movement. And I think that is what is going to tackle the world's issues. And we're not talking about ideology. We're just looking at speaking to experts, looking at evidence and creating policies that reflect the data. That's all it needs. And once we have that plan, I'll be confident that we are going to deal with climate change, which is just rising emissions, but also air pollution and poverty eradication, you know, which I think should be an embedded part of all of this. You know, I don't think you can just separate that out from all of the issues that we're talking about. And on the top of people changing their minds in the environmental space, I want to do a plug for a very interesting speech by Mark Linus. And Mark actually has been on the podcast in the past to talk about this. Mark is somebody who was a pretty radical Greenpeace activist in the 1990s, who actually at one point was complicit in burning down fields with GMO crops. And he was also a very well-known speaker and writer about the urgency of climate change. And he found himself at some point thinking, you know, isn't it strange that when it comes to climate change, I keep telling people, listen to the science, follow the scientists. And then when it came to GMOs, I kept saying, you know, the scientists are all bored off and they're corrupt and you can't trust them and they're saying it's safe, but that's just because it's all a big conspiracy. And at some point, this tension got too much for him and he gave a very interesting speech to the Oxford Farming Conference, which is a sort of very anti-GMO, sort of coming out as a GMO supporter. So that's very interesting, I think. A final question for you, Zion. I imagine that you have tried to convince some of your uh, friends and some of your political comrades to follow your evolution on nuclear energy and perhaps a few other issues. How did that go? Did you succeed to some extent or did it become sort of acrimonious and bitter quite quickly? Well, that's a big question. It's been mixed. I've had a lot of support. I've had a lot of people who just want to talk about the issue. I mean, all I'm doing is trying to talk about the issue. I'm not out there to convince anyone that I don't see that as my role. I think that if you look at the issue, you will just come to the same conclusion that I've come to, that you know, James Hansen has come to, that Mark Linus came to, because that's what the data is telling us. And there is so much available now that it's really easy for anyone to take that route. So I'm happy to just have the initial conversations that has been happening on an exponential level, people getting in touch that I didn't know, people that I've known for a long time, people in these movements, outside of these movements. That's been really interesting. But at the same time, a small group of people who are really just probably, you know, in that camp that they'll never change their minds. There's always a small percentage that just they won't change their mind. That's fine. That exists in all groups. So, for example, one thing I studied, studied during my master's was, va- you know, how to talk to people about vaccines. And they found four groups of parents and the three groups, there were different ways of approaching them that would help them to change their minds about being anti-vaccination. But there was one group, very small percentage, but it was like, it was almost like a religion for them. It was a fundamental belief. And as soon as you could identify that group, there's no point in even talking to those parents because they wouldn't change their mind. So this group has been very, it's such a small group of people, but they're so loud and dominating and they're all from an old generation as well, which I think is telling because I've had a lot of younger people reach out who don't have the hangups and don't have the kind of associated fears as some of the older generation do. And I was talking earlier about 
when you have these conversations, it's important to appeal to values and feelings. Well, ultimately, I share the same values as a lot of these people in the environmental movement. I share the same values as you or as anyone else who cares about poverty eradication, you know, who doesn't want to just say, well, they have to live like that and we need to live a bit more like that. You know, I'm pro-human. Humans are good. So actually... I've had a huge amount of support for that, but this small group who's extremely anti, you know, and they're not all people I know. Some of them are, and some of them I don't know who they are. They've taken it so personally. And for them, it is like I've attacked their identity and by becoming pro-nuclear and by advocating for it vocally. And it's hit them so hard that they're arguing that our values are different. We're different people now. We care about different things. And I'm still sitting here saying, I care about the same things as you. You're just taking a different approach, which is a more evidence-based approach. And so I had this recently happen just the other day where Extinction Rebellion released a press statement on me saying that the press shouldn't platform me, calling me a climate denier. I've spent my entire life talking about climate change. You know, it's really easy to research online. I've been writing about it for years. It's still what I'm talking about. The fact that I'm reframing it to say, let's look at what people in other countries need and that that's important. And the fact that I'm bringing in nuclear doesn't mean that I'm a climate denier. But, you know, for some people, it's hurt their values so much that they now have to say, well, you have opposite values, so you must be a denier, which I kind of find interesting. And also, I think it was inevitable that that would happen. Obviously, you know that I'm not a climate denier, but it's that tribal thing about what well, you're in that tribe now. So you must be in that camp. And that's kind of ridiculous because there are lots of people who care about climate change who are pro-nuclear, but because they don't have any kind of tribe, we do look like we're just the enemy, you know, and almost when you have a tribe, it's easier to stand up for your values because you can say they are X, Y, Z, and that we are pro-human and we are, we're pro-restoration of nature, but not to the disadvantage of humans, we don't believe that humans should suffer. You know, that's a really important point. And I think it's it's okay to have a discussion about that. But telling people not to platform me is basically saying, I'm not going to have that discussion. And I have come across that, as I say, with nuclear for quite a long time. And I think that small group is never going to shift on that. So really, I'm just not paying attention to it and trying to go around and talk to all the other people who I know, sit on a, somewhere different on the fence in a different space, you know, and that actually... A lot of people, because of climate change and because they understand that air pollution kills 6 million people a year, are really concerned about viable solutions and are now embracing nuclear, whereas they might not have before. Because actually, you know, as I say, I wouldn't even be advocating for it if it wasn't for these issues. Climate change has kind of forced my hand, and especially because I used to speak against it. And I believe, you know, that was wrong. And I'm trying to make that right. And it's a difficult position to be in. But I really think we need more pro science advocates in all areas because there's a risk, you know, there's a risk that there's this growing body of anti science sentiment and that that will lead to really poor decisions being made when it actually comes to government creating policies. And if we want to tackle climate emergency, it has got to be led by data. Dion, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please make suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Thank you.